So you can recording has begun. I think I need to click OK on here. All right, let's begin. So, as we've said a couple of times already, we're going through the book of Nehemiah. We're not going through every single verse of the book, but uh, we're taking four weeks to um, take out some important principles from the story of Nehemiah. So, it's my job to um, bring things to a close. This is the fourth of four messages on that. So, if you remember, Peter um, gave us the first message and included what he um, showed us was the map um, just pointing out how far away Susa, which is to the right of the screen and the capital of um, Persia at the time and where Nehemiah was based, is away from Jerusalem. And of course, Jerusalem was on Nehemiah's heart. Peter also gave us this um, timeline, which I found really helpful. And so just remind us of what has been happening up to this point. So you'll see um, on the very top there, it says Ezra 1 to 6. And that's the time when the, um, the people were given freedom to go back to Jerusalem. So the decree of Cyrus. And the role that they took on at that time was to rebuild the temple. They were able to do that, but it was not as good as it used to be. But it was a huge um, effort in any case. Um, you'll see underneath the timeline that there was about 50,000 people that went to Jerusalem at that time. So it's a remnant of all the people who were in Babylon, maybe a tenth of all the people that were there of the um, Israelites or people from Judah. So then after that time, on this timeline, you'll see that Esther gets a mention, and so she became queen, and she was instrumental in the role of foiling a plot, a plot that was going to get rid of all of the Israelites. And so um, the Israelites, long time after that, even today, celebrate the day of Esther's, Queen Esther's success. And then where we are in the story of Nehemiah is after those events. And so we remembered that um, Nehemiah gets a visit from his relatives and they give him the story of what's going on in Jerusalem. And it's not a great story. And then we had a message from Leslie and she was reminding us that this story of Nehemiah was pointing out that there is a time to act. We hear the bad news, we hear things that concern us, and our heartstrings get pulled, but then what are we going to do about it? And Nehemiah chose to act. And we also saw um, from Leslie's presentation this map of the wall of Jerusalem, and it's showing how many different groups of people were involved in rebuilding this wall. So it was a real team effort, and that was one of the things that came up in that little exercise that we've just been through. And you've got loads of names there. Um, if you want to Google it, you'll be able to see that map, and you can um, check it out for yourself. And then we had Wesley. Where's Wesley? <laughs> And he gave us a, a fantastic presentation and pointing out that the story was about overcoming opposition. And so if you remember, there were the, the three stooges who were um, up against Nehemiah and they were trying to undermine him, to trick him, to mock him and to get him to stop being involved in this mission of rebuilding the wall. And here's the picture that Wesley showed us. So we have Nehemiah seated down, being focused on the job in hand. And we've got Tobias and Ballot and Geshem trying to take him off his game, which he refused to do. 
Now, I think it might be useful for us to get an idea of just what's going on around Judah at this time. So on this map on the screen, you'll see that Judah is the uh, area in green and Jerusalem is in the middle of that area. It's probably worth pointing out that most of the people who come back out of um, exile weren't actually living in Jerusalem at that time. They were living in the towns around it. So it was a relatively small number of people who were actually of the Israelite people who were actually living in Jerusalem. And surrounding them is a bunch of territories which were not really nicely disposed towards Judah. So you've got on the uh, west coast, which is the Mediterranean, you've got Ashdod, and you've got the, the plain of Ono. And so that's the area that was um, still being, um, uh, trying to think of the right word here, um, influenced by the, the Philistines that had never really been taken over some of those areas by Israel. Above Judah, you've got Samaria. So that's where the kingdom of Israel was, captured by Nineveh, Assyria, and dispersed throughout all of its territories. And so the people who were there at this time were not particularly wanting to welcome the people from Judah who were holding to the old faith. Underneath um, Judah, you've got Idumea, and so you've got the, um, the Arabs and the, their territories. And once again, they're not well disposed towards Judah. On the east, you've got Ammon and Moab. And these are ancient enemies of Israel and Judah. And so it's surrounded by groups of people who do not want to see Judah thrive. And this is what Nehemiah was being confronted with when his relatives came to visit him and say the walls are in disrepair. Now, Judah is just a small territory, and it's easy to be dominated by everyone around you when you haven't got a stronghold. And Jerusalem was meant to be that stronghold. The temple had been rebuilt, and that was a good thing, but the walls were not providing security. They were demolished. And so Nehemiah took on the role to get the walls rebuilt. And by doing that, that would provide security for the people of Judah. In times of trouble, they could go into Jerusalem and be safe. The temple would be protected. And so Jerusalem would be the stronghold that it always used to be. But of course, when you've got a bunch of people around you who do not want to see you thrive, they're going to feel really challenged by the idea of walls being built around uh, Jerusalem. So you can get the tension there, can't you? You can see what's going on. So who are the players in this story? Now, I haven't included God as a player. So I'm, I'm saying he sets the board up, all right? So people, the players on the board. We've got Nehemiah. He's the cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes, who's the king of Persia at that time. You've got the families who are in Jerusalem, and you've got Ezra, who's been there for quite some time, and we have his story in the Bible, in the book of Ezra. Now, I've put those people in one column on the left there, because they're the, the group that really want to see this wall built. It's on their hearts that Jerusalem is protected and that Judah is protected and the people of God will actually thrive. Then you've got a bunch of people in the middle column. So Eliashem is a bit ambivalent about things. He's actually the head priest. So he's in charge of uh, a lot of the religious ceremonies that go on in Jerusalem. And he's one of the first to step up and get the wall built. So that's a good thing when you want to see the wall, but wall actually wall, losing my words, wall actually built. But then later on, we learn that he has family ties to Tobiah, 
and is actually undermining the work that Nehemiah is, work, is working on. So you have the Jews who lived near the enemy. So they're the ones who are not actually in Jerusalem itself, but they're in the towns around, and they're heavily influenced by the, um, the groups around them. And so they're wanting to survive, and they're feeling threatened by these other groups that live around them. And so they have slightly different concerns to those who are living in Jerusalem. You've got the nobles who've been there for quite some time. They're doing quite well, thank you very much. They've been able to gather wealth by being the nobles in that area. And you've got the officials who run the place, and they're doing pretty well as things stand as well. So these, this middle group are kind of conflicted. They like the idea of the wall being built, but they've got other concerns that are going on as well. With the wall being built, their relatively comfortable lives and wealthy lives are going to be challenged. Are they prepared for that kind of upheaval? Is this wall important enough for them to be fully on side? And in the story, we find that there's a bit of this and a bit of that going on. And then on the right-hand side, we have another group of people. These are the ones who are actively opposed to this wall being built. So Sam Ballot, we learn that he's uh, from the, one of the territories on the east of Judah, and so is Tobiah. And these are the groups of people that God has said will not be admitted into Israel because they are the ancient enemies of Israel. But it's kind of confusing because Sanballat is a, a important person in the area. He's got a, um, a rulership kind of role and that's being challenged by this wall being built. Tobiah is, is related to Eliashib. So one of his kids has married one of Eliashib's kids, and so there's a connection there, which is partly why Eliashib is getting undermined by, uh, from his commitment to the wall. Tobiah also wants to be seen as part of the Israelite, the people of Judah, um, uh, history, but he's not able to prove that he does come from that stock. And so by marrying into the, the families of Judah, he's trying to gain respectability in that area. So a wall being built is also a wall that's cutting him off from that kind of influence. So he's actively against it. Geshem is seen, uh, seen as the Arab, so from the south of Judah. He's actively against this because this is stopping some of the power and influence that he would have. And those three are seen as the main uh, protagonists against this wall being built. And it's easy as you read the story to think of them just as individuals. But actually they're representing each one of them, a local power that is actually standing up against what God wants in Jerusalem. And then you've got Shemaiah, who's actually meant to be a prophet of God. And there were a whole bunch of prophets who were in Jerusalem, and some of them were faithful, and some of them were not. This one, Shemaiah, is the one that actively tried to get Nehemiah to hide in the temple and therefore lose credibility, hide from the attacks that might be coming his way. But Nehemiah didn't fall for that trickery, as Wesley told us last week. And there were a bunch of prophets who were saying things like this to Nehemiah, who were trying to undermine his efforts. So these are the players. And it's easy to focus on the ones who are totally for the wall and the ones that are totally against the wall being built and miss out on the middle column of those who are kind of for it and kind of against it, depending on the setting that they find themselves. And so that's what Nehemiah chapter 5 
is all about. These groups of people who are actually undermining the work of Nehemiah and this wall getting built. Now, bear in mind that the story of the wall getting built is done in 52 days. That's an incredible achievement. And this is what Nehemiah, with his focus, was able to achieve with those who wanted to work on the wall, who were wanting to see what God wanted to be coming into fruition. But in chapter 5, which is in the middle, obviously, of chapter 4 and 6, which we looked at last week, we have a different story going on. And it's saying, about this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families. We need more food to survive. Is that something we can relate to today with groups of people in our own communities? Others said, we've mortgaged our fields, vineyards, and homes to get food during the famine. Once again, it's a story that we can relate to today. And others said, we've had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like theirs, yet we must sell our children. This gets me. Sell our silk children into slavery just to get enough money to live. They're saying, we've already sold some of our daughters and we're helpless to do anything about it for our fields and our vineyards are already mortgaged to others. This is what was going on while the wall was being built. So when Nehemiah heard their complaints, he was very angry. You can understand why, right? After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials and I told them, you're hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. And then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, we're doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners. But you're selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. This is a picture of our own time as well, isn't it? How do we relate to that? So what's that got to do with building a wall? I mean, that's the focus of the story, isn't it? Getting the wall built so that there will be security, so that Judah will be safe. The people of God will be able to worship him in safety, not be overwhelmed by the people who are around them. But we've got this different story that's happening inside them. So we talked about memories already today. We talked about the Berlin Wall coming down. And on our table, we were talking about some of um, the memories we have from earlier, um, even the Second World War. And from around that time, the 1930s, there was this idea of a fifth column that was being mooted. And this comes from the Spanish Civil War. So at the time, there was um, the, the rebels who were trying to take over some of the towns, and they were bragging that they had four columns of um, army people coming to take a town over. And then they had a secret fifth column who was going to work from the inside. Now, in that actual event, they didn't succeed. But the idea of that was, has been taken on in subsequent years. And so for those of you who love your history, at the beginning of the, the Second World War, there was a group called the Fifth Column, taken from that idea of the, the Spanish Civil War, who actively worked on behalf of the Germans 
and they were in Denmark and Norway. And that fifth column group undermined the local authorities and paved the way for Germany to walk into Denmark and Norway virtually unopposed. This happened. And it's that idea that's being put to us in this chapter five of Nehemiah. There's a group of people, these players in the middle column that we looked at, who are undermining the work of Nehemiah. And they're doing it by conforming to what's going on in the world around them. And they're hurting their own people. So the story carries on. Nehemiah pressed further. What you're doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? So they're conforming to what the enemy nations are doing. What makes them different? So Nehemiah says, I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day, and repay the interest you charge when you lend them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. And they replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. Nehemiah knows his people, right? He wasn't just going to let them off with a, a simple statement. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. And the whole assembly responded, Amen. And they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. And so that's why I put that group of people, the nobles and the officials, in the middle column of that table we looked at. Because they kind of wanted the best for the people of God. But they also wanted the best for themselves. And they had conformed to what was going on in the world around them charging interest, by accepting their own people into slavery so that they could get rich, so that they could be comfortable. And so they were undermining what Nehemiah was trying to do. So the story of Nehemiah is about being on a mission and building a wall. And we're quite clear that that's the case, and we've had three weeks of focusing on the wall. But it's more than that story just on its own. It's also building character and recognizing that relationships and ethics and love for our neighbor is just as important. See, Nehemiah could have completed the wall and not dealt with this issue. And that would not have been success. Because within the wall, there would have been failure as a community. There would have been an undermining of everything that God stands for within that wall. And so he had to look at what was going on on the inside while also being totally focused on what was going on on the outside. You can't have just one without the other. With relationships, well, we're one family. How is it that some parts of our family can be wealthy and take advantage of other parts of our family? How can that be okay? That's what Nehemiah is saying. Ethics. How do we conduct ourselves when we're not in church? Is it okay to take advantage of people around us just because we can? Is that acceptable? I've come across in my lifetime a number of Christian people who run businesses whose business ethics would not be wanting to come to light. And it's not good enough. 
What we talk about on Sunday is what we've got to live throughout the week. And if we're not prepared to be consistent in that way, be ethical, then we're undermining everything we talk about on Sunday. And love for our neighbor. Well, we know that this is the second commandment. First of all, to love God with all of our heart, with our whole being, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that just wasn't happening in the story from chapter 5 of Nehemiah. But it needed to happen. And when Nehemiah did point it out in public, in front of the whole assembly, then those who were taking advantage were ashamed. They couldn't stand up for what they had done. And they agreed to undo what they had done. I wonder how we would react in that situation. So this leads us to us today. We actually are in the same situation. We're trying to build a wall, build security for our people. We're trying to build a kingdom, God's kingdom. And so our mission is to be engaged in advancing God's kingdom. And we talk about our mission a lot. We talk about inviting people to come to know Jesus. We talk about showing hospitality. We talk about discipling. And these are vital and these are our focus. This is our mission. This is our war. That's what we're called to be doing. But as we're building this wall, are we thinking about what undermines us? Are we thinking about the things that try to make us conform to the ways of this world? Trying to think of our own financial security at the expense of others. Ignoring the plight of those around us who are no different to us really at all. Those who have large families and need more that don't have it. Those who are disadvantaged for whatever reason and are having to put themselves into debt just to get by day by day. Are we accepting that it's okay? I hope not. For me, a number of years ago, that was the question that I had to answer. I was a leader of a company, and it was taking advantage of people. And I had to decide for myself, could I stay there? Could I influence it? Could I accept it? Or did I have to get out of it? And the answer for me was getting out of it because I couldn't do those other two things. But that's not enough. It's one thing to remove ourselves from the problem area, but then what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to accept that this is how things happen in the world today? The people are in virtual slavery because of decisions that they've made about getting into debt. Is that just too hard of an issue and we, we can't do anything about it? Well, the reality, as we know, is that we can do something about it. And this church already is, is supporting the work of Christians Against Poverty, which is doing something about it. And so I'm pleased to be able to stand up in the front of this room and say that we care. And we are doing something about it. We just... We need to be intentional about these things. So we're providing some monetary support to CAT, and that's great, and it enables a good mission to happen. But are we intentional about all of our days throughout the week and the impact that we have on those around us? 
So that leads us to this table question. What are the things that distract you, me, from doing God's work? And how can we fight these distractions? So have a chat about that. You've got about um, just over five minutes. And then let's see what we have to say.